observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Here's an interesting one. Uh, this one comes from Travis. Dear Mr. Burnett, I wanted to start by saying how much I respect you and your opinion on nerd and geek culture. I might not always agree with you, but I cannot deny how well crafted your opinions are. I'm writing you to voice my frustrations with Hollywood and their attempts to seemingly kill fandom. I am a huge Marvel, DC, and Star Wars fan, the George Lucas version. I guess I'm just looking for advice on whether to continue to support these properties that are controlled by individuals that seemingly hate their fans. I'm mainly talking about Star Wars in that the decisions Lucasfilm has made of late are causing me to question if I can still support the product. I'm still excited for everything Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni have planned, but everything else seems to be driven by identity politics. Between that and their employees attacking fans online, I feel I can no longer support them. I love The Mandalorian, and I'm excited for the Ahsoka and Bad Batch series. However, that starts in May, by the way. Crazy! However, I feel like if I keep supporting Star Wars content, I'm just enabling the company's toxic behavior. I long for when the opinions of fans were listened to and respected. I feel that as long as Kathleen Kennedy remains head of Lucasfilm, I can no longer support them or Disney itself. I do know that there is hope for fandom as evidenced by the Snyder Cut. The one thing I will say is that my love for George Lucas's Star Wars will never die no matter how hard Lucasfilm attempts to drive me away. It pains me to see how they've sullied a once great company's name. Live long and prosper and may the force be with you. Sincerely, Travis. Hmm. I have a lot to say about this letter. But first, the, the, the first thing that I, that I would like to say is this. The other night uh, on Whining About Movies, Elizabeth and I watched The Color Purple. After I watched it, I delved into Laurent Bozero's documentaries that were ported over from probably the Laserdisc or the, DV the DVD probably on the making of the film. Do you know who... The producers of The Color Purple were, well, besides John Peters and Peter Goober, that's right, Frank Marshall and Kathleen Kennedy. The Color Purple came out in 1985. It was nominated for, I believe, 11 Oscars. It won none, but it's a movie that I, I really, really love. And if you watch the behind-the-scenes special features, you will see Kathleen Kennedy speaking. She's smart, she's articulate, and she clearly knows how to produce movies now remember her first production credit was in 1982 she well that's part my pardon me her first credit as a full producer was in 1982 on spielberg's et that was a long time ago and if you watch her talking about empire of the sun you realize what a smart cookie she really is and if you go back in time or you go back well, to the IMDb page, and look at her credits. Uh, her, her, the, 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 it is astonishing to me just how many legendary films she was involved with producing. And what I find very interesting about that is that fandom is so quick to dismiss her. I've heard everything with, oh, she just gets people coffee, or, you know, oh, this, or oh, that, or, and I love the YouTube community that has embraced me, the film pundit community and all the people that I stream with. But I, the one place that we're always going to part ways is my feelings about Kathleen Kennedy. Kathleen Kennedy was a trailblazer. Not only was she an incredible producer who worked with incredible people, but what a lot of people don't understand is, is people like Steven Spielberg only work with the best people. Steven Spielberg is not working with somebody who he has to carry. He's not giving someone like Kathleen Kennedy a vanity producing position because she offers nothing. Spielberg has said that Kathleen Kennedy was one of the best producers, if not the best producer, he's ever worked with. Steven Spielberg. And she's been making movies producing your childhood since 1982. 
So before everyone starts to go off and pillory Kathleen Kennedy, whether it's online or on Twitter or on Reddit or whatever, I would say she's one of the most accomplished producers in all of Hollywood. Now, I'm not trying to kiss her ass. I've never met Kathleen Kennedy, but I've admired her since I was a kid. She was one of the people that I was like, oh, my God, Kennedy Marshall. Kennedy Marshall. That's Kathleen Kennedy and her husband, Frank Marshall. I mean, they were involved in half the movies I looked forward to when I was a kid. And it's strange to me now, because I'm fucking old compared to the rest of the YouTube pundit space. I'm probably the oldest. I swear to God. No uh, no one else my age is, is an idiot enough to be on YouTube. No, I, I'm just kidding. Um, I think more people my age should be on YouTube. Now they've all found Clubhouse, so they don't have to be on camera. <laughs> Boy, Clubhouse, that's a whole nother thing. My God. Um, but anyway, I, I, um, I have great respect for her. And I think that, um, the, the currents and eddies of Hollywood are difficult to manage. And I would say this, it was Kathleen Kennedy who put Dave Filoni and John Favreau together that was able to get the Mandalorian made. It's her idea and she still had a Lucasfilm. So the Mandalorian wouldn't exist without her. Now, a lot of people have called into question the fact that how many directors have come and gone on Star Wars projects. Well, I wish people would stop and remember that when a company buys Star Wars and lays out $4 billion, I mean, anyone who says, oh, come on, Rob, Star Wars is worth it. it was, they always knew it was going to make money. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. They didn't know Star Wars was going to make the kind of money it could make. It was a risk. And Bob Iger was taking a risk. Uh, George Lucas had put Kathleen Kennedy in, in a position in charge of, of of Lucasfilm, and Lucas himself was fully aware and 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 didn't have a doubt to put Kathleen Kennedy, one of the most accomplished producers in history, if not the most accomplished female producer in history, in 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 front of the Star Wars franchise. Have we? Are we better off now? With the the movies, I mean, it's definitely been a mixed bag. I I hated the J.J. Abrams. I call it the J.J. Abrams sequel trilogy because he started it and he ended it. But um, was that Kathleen Kennedy's fault? On paper, it was probably a smart move to hire J.J. Abrams. I wouldn't have. <laughs> I would have said, no. <laughs> He's never made a science fiction film that impressed me at all. I mean, I like regarding Henry. And a lot of his TV work has been something I've been interested in, but it always seems to peter out like after a season and a half. That Super Bowl episode of Alias when SD6 was taken down, that was the end of that show. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. But but this idea that you have to remember, Disney is a publicly held corporation. It's in the business of entertaining the greatest amount of people it can possibly entertain. It is dealing with staggering amounts of money that we can't possibly conceive of in our lifetimes. I mean, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, I can I can conceive of quite a bit. I can imagine quite a bit. You'll get it. I'd better. You will. Well, anyway, so I just think that um, you just have to be mindful. Kathleen Kennedy is a woman and a person and a producer who is worth the utmost or, or, or is owed the utmost respect. The way she's been vilified in the fan community, I think, is unjust. And I think it also shows um, a little less maturity on the on the part of a lot of my fellow, my friends, and people that I really like. But I stream with them, and every time somebody talks shit about Kathleen Kennedy, I cringe. I'm like, have you forgotten? I mean, this idea that, that she's her accomplishments are belittled all the time drives me insane. I'm like, wh what, you think that... That someone just gave her, just threw her a producing credit just because, and they've been doing that for almost 40 fucking years? That's not how Hollywood works. I'm sorry. When you're doing those kinds of things, Kathleen Kennedy and her husband Frank Marshall are down in the trenches filmmakers. Now, Kathleen Kennedy's responsibilities, I can't even imagine, not just a producer, not just an executive, but there are seldom, there may be never, has been somebody that was placed in a more pressure-filled position than Kathleen Kennedy was when she was put in charge of Lucasfilm and Lucasfilm was bought by Disney because they expected her to perform in a way that was, uh, I think, 
above and beyond anything any Hollywood producer had ever had to do in the past. And the scrutiny and the money. I mean, they come out of the gate. Oh, great. Our first movie is The Force Awakens. And oh, great. It made $2 billion. Because that set a benchmark that was... how You're never going to get to that again. Well, Rob, what about the MCU? Look... I love Kevin Feige. I think Kevin Feige, I do not compare and contrast Kevin Feige with Kathleen Kennedy because they're two different people. Kathleen Kennedy is not somebody who is steeped in Star Wars lore. She's not somebody who knows anything about the extended universe. She doesn't know about the Marvel comics. If I said, Kathleen, if I met her for dinner and started talking about who jibs or Jackson, she'd be like, who's that? I'm like, Jackson, you know, the giant bunny rabbit in the Star Wars universe. She'd be like, what? Well, what about the who jibs? Huh? Well, what about Grand Admiral Thrawn? Maybe she's become aware of Grand Admiral Thrawn, but I bet not. And nor is it her job to. And you'd say, well, Rob, she's running Lucasfilm. I'm like, yes, she's running Lucasfilm, and it's her job to make a film. But filmmaking is a production in terms of, think of it as like an assembly line. Instead of thinking about how movies affect us, the viewer, as we watch them, uh, think about how movies are actually made. And the one thing about Kathleen Kennedy is she came up and she worked with the very best modern directors working in cinema today. The best. And she was used to the best. And I would say that the problems that you have to look at Kathleen Kennedy, she tried to hire people out of the box. Lord and Miller, Gareth Edwards. Um, she tried. She gave people shots. She did some innovative things. And yes, I understand. The Force is female. Those Nike shirts, I get it. I understand that. But here's my point. Don't be mad at the corporations that now control your franchises. Because the corporations do not understand those franchises, nor will they ever understand the franchises the way we do as audience members. Our experience of the finished product that they're making is very different from their experience of making that product. And that is something I think that we all have to really remember. So as a fan, just remember that a corporation that has now spent all this money on Star Wars is looking at... Here's the thing. <laughs> Disney does not understand the corporations, the marketing people, whatever. The idea that the sequel toys didn't sell. I could go on. We were talking about it today on Fully Articulated, as and I. I could sit down at a marketing meeting with the best marketing executives in the world that have all the most comprehensive data about Star Wars toys. I could get up in that room and I could say, here's why they're not selling. And basically, and here's why the characters in the sequel trilogy, the Disney sequel trilogy, didn't sell. And they would, they'd be looking furiously around their spreadsheets. Why? Tell us the secret. And the answer is, because they're not cool. That's what we're talking about on the, on, the, on the show today. I mean, maybe people like Kylo Ren and there's fans that like Ray and they want to ship the two of them together. I get it. I understand all that. But those films, there was nothing in there that, that, that we were, all the stuff that would have been cool in those movies are the exact opposite of what the marketing people at Disney would tell you that Han Solo and Chewbacca are cool. How Han Solo was killed was not cool. Han Solo was never allowed to be cool in those movies. Um, Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, and Princess Leia are never together. R2 and 3PO, they're never together in those films. That is, according to those marketing people, they'll tell you that Disney would say, well, no, all of our demographics say that we need to have new characters that appeal to a younger generation. And that's the whole point. We have to create moving forward. We can't allow the history or future of Star Wars to, to, to rely on our old legacy characters. That's what they would tell you in a marketing meeting. That's what the executives at Disney would tell you. That's what Bob Iger would tell you. Actually, Bob Iger might tell you something different. But the point is, was it... The fault of who that they didn't put Luke, Han, Leia, R2, 3PO, Chewie, Lando in the same frame together in that, in that trilogy. From a corporate standpoint, they did what corporations and what marketing and what analytics and research tells them they should have done. The problem is 
All of that corporate research and analytics and marketing and shit doesn't tell you, it doesn't give you the right answer. And corporate, corporate America, especially bigger corporations, they don't get that. You know who gets that? You know who would be the first person to come in and say, um, yeah, no, ixnay on that. We're going to put all the main characters together. I read this script and you never have Han, Leia, Luke. They, they never get together. Uh, yeah, we're not going to do that. You know who would know that? You know who would have said that right off the bat? I'll give you one guess. His name starts with a Kevin. Kevin Feige. Because Kevin Feige understands. Why does he understand? Because he was a fan living in the fan space. He went in and became a professional. PA'd for Richard Donner. Worked on 13 Marvel movies before the MCU. And he knows the answer to that. Kathleen Kennedy's worked on lots of different movies. But she's not a fan. What she is is a producer. A producer, you know what a producer is? A producer is a fan of the project they're making right now. And you know what they're a fan of? Producers usually, and I'll say this right off the bat, most producers are thinking about, okay, what do you need? When do you need it? How much do you need of it? And how much is it going to cost? That's what a producer does. A producer is like a general moving men and machines and personnel, men and women and people around, personnel around to accomplish a goal. They're fighting a battle. If you were to ask a producer, well, um, you know, tell me about what's your, what's your favorite starship in the Star Wars universe? I mean, what do you like? Like, do you like this Corvette class or do you like these Carillion freighters or do you like something built at the Kuat shipyards? I mean, what are you into? Kathleen Kennedy would be like, what did you just say? She wouldn't know what the fuck you just said. And nor should she. It's not her job to know. That's why she hires people that are supposed to know their jobs. What happened with the Star Wars universe is that, unfortunately, everybody working on the sequel trilogy had a different agenda. They had a different agenda. Bad Robot thought they could muscle in and get, ooh, this is a lucrative, this is a lucrative opportunity because Bad Robot is thinking holistically. What can Bad, that's why J.J. Abrams wanted a $500 million deal with Warner Brothers. It doesn't matter what the fuck he's making. I mean, sure, he loves Star Wars, but when he gets in there, it's like, why the fuck does C-3PO have a red arm? So, hey, Bad Robot can get some of that cheddar. Seriously, why does the Millennium Falcon not have a circular dish anymore? It's got a rectangular dish. Why? Because everything that had the Millennium Falcon, everything they sold with the Millennium Falcon with a rectangular dish, some of that went to Bad Robot. It's not what you, it's not what you deserve. It's what you negotiate. And Bad Robot was looking for a lucrative place to print money. It didn't work with Star Trek, didn't work with Star Wars. So they got Warner Brothers to give them half a billion dollars. Welcome home, boys. I know you've never been here before, but that's what they were looking for. So here's the thing. Forget all that. Concentrate on what it is that you love. And what I love right now, Mandalorian. I I love all that. I I love what they're doing with the Mandalorian and all that. The situation with Cara Dune. The situation with, I understand, I, 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 I get it. But you have to understand something. What was going on internally, what we love about Star Wars and what happened to Gina Carano was shitty. It was shitty. And we can talk all about all the hypocrisy that we want. But the fact is that what happened to Gina Carano had nothing to do with Star Wars. It had everything to do with a corporation and what a corporation's image has to be. So don't hate Star Wars because you could, you should love Star Wars all you want. And don't hate Kathleen Kennedy. Hate the fact that a corporation like Disney, yes, are they hypocritical? All those things. I'm not going to argue with you. But Disney invested $4 billion of money, which, by the way, was a huge risk. And you know what? Uh, we got Rogue One out of it. Uh, we got, uh, you know, I kind of liked Solo. We got The Mandalorian, and I would suspect, I would suspect that most of the Star Wars TV shows that we're going to get are going to be pretty great. Do I love The Mandalorian? I don't even love The Mandalorian. I don't love it. But you know what? I, I think that Star Wars could be so much more than The Mandalorian. But for what it is, it's pretty fucking cool. And uh, I choose to move forward with Disney knowing that they're making The Mandalorian. What happened to Cara Dune... And what happened to Gina Carano fucking sucks.
It sucks. And she got shafted. However, you also have to take into consideration that she knew what she was doing. Everyone's a big boy now and a big girl or a a big Alderanian. And um, uh, uh, she knew. And when you're working for Disney, I think all of us would understand. I mean, they were calling Disney Mauschwitz in the 80s, you know, under, under Eisner. So, and Katzenberg. So it's like, everyone knows this. Don't hate Star Wars. Hate the fact that corporate America and artistic America will always be at loggerheads. And that fans, now I understand. You know what? Do I think Pablo Hidalgo should have attacked Star Wars Theory? No. I think Star Wars Theory, I like Star Wars Theory a lot. I've streamed with Star Wars Theory. And that was shitty. That's something you don't do either. Like, I mean, fans, you know, I hate to say it, but there's an attitude that fans are going to show up anyway. There is this there is this attitude because corporate America doesn't understand fandom. It never will. We're weird. We're strange people. We're strange folk. They don't understand. Like, God love William Shatner. I love William Shatner. I directed him in a movie. I wrote and directed a movie that William Shatner stars in. My f- idol. But I wouldn't sit down ever with William Shatner and and have a Star Trek trivia contest with him. One, he wouldn't know the answers to any of the questions. And two, he would hate me for even putting him in that position. He'd be like, uh, well, let's go to the equestrian center and let me tell you about my horses. He has no interest and nor should he. And it's up to us to understand why that is. We have to be better than that. It's up to us as fans to set the tone. You know, corporate America is not going to change the way they do anything because at the end of the day, their bottom line is their bottom line. You know, and that's the way they work. And they don't hate the fans. They don't. They hate, They, but they don't think of us as fans. We're consumers to them. We're consumers, rightly or wrongly. And, you know, I think it's best when creators have great relationships with their fans. And you have to say, I mean, I know it's money-making and all that, but think about the fact that it is Disney kept up the tradition. They're putting on the Star Wars celebrations. They're actively encouraging all kinds of fandom. Yes, underneath the Disney umbrella, it fucking sucks. I get it. I understand. But they did buy Star Wars, and I think that overall, when I looked at that presentation that they made at the Disney investor meeting and showed how many shows they're going they're making and if we're already loving the mandalorian and if the continuity between the animated shows i think star wars has a really great future and i think it would be a shame to miss out on it that's just me are we still going to yell and scream and bitch and moan and complain yes as we should no one's going to tell me not to stop um, complaining about Star Trek. You know what's going to make, you know what's going to stop me complaining about Star Trek? Make good Star Trek. Everyone like, well, not everyone, but people love The Mandalorian. That's how you make people stop bitching about Star Wars. You make good Star Wars. Hey, if the people that are working on Star Trek now could make good Star Trek, I'd stop bitching. I don't have any faith that they can. But what's interesting is the powers that be at CBS do, or they've got, I mean, again, Secret Hideout, they signed a great contract. They got what they negotiated, and more power to them. I All those guys and girls over there at, at Bad Robot, their adjunct company or whatever, good for you. Good for you. Good for you getting paid. And everyone's getting paid, and everyone's trying their hardest. But you know what? Try harder. But that's kind of the way it all works. I think we as fans, it's up to us. How do we want to be treated? How do we want to be treated? We have to set a tone. We're the ones that have to show, we're the ones that have to take the fanatic out of fan. That's all I'm saying. So I'm sure that might not make me popular in some quarters, but for every for every place that lets us down, look at the Snyder Cut, a victory of fandom. And I would say look at that fact that fandom now coexists. I, I, I mean... All the fans that were involved in the Snyder Cut movement <clears throat> that believed they were the ones, it was it was the message that they were putting forth. Yeah, there was toxicity, but there was also people raising money for suicide prevention. You know, and, and at the end of the day, it's a pretty great story, uh, what fandom was able to do. 
uh, and I think positivity or help or being 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 that way is always going to get you more than um, other methods. Anyway, uh, a great subject. I want to thank you for writing in. I would just say this, Travis. Don't give up on what you love. Why? 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 Why give up on what you love? Don't do that. 